Good day and welcome to worship here at the Princeton University Chapel, sponsored by the Office of Religious Life. I am Teresa Timms and I serve as the Associate Dean of the Office of Religious Life and of the Chapel. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday, June 6, 2021. During the summer months here at our University Chapel, we welcome guest preachers. And this Sunday, we are welcoming our colleague, the Reverend Alan Wabakanashi. Alan serves as the, as the chaplain for the Episcopal Church here on the Princeton University campus. Hear now this call to worship. In all times and in all places, God is with us. God's love flows over and around us, lifting us in hope. With this hope, we give thanks and praise to God. Thanks be to God for God's loving presence. Amen. Greetings, my friend. Um, I'm Alan Wakabayashi, the chaplain for the Episcopal Church at Princeton. And I come bearing a, a word from reading from the reading of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace as it extends to more and more people may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now in our reading from 2 Corinthians, we get this look at Paul's persevering faith that kept him going in ministry amidst intense suffering and persecution. Later in the letter in chapter 11, we hear in more detail what Paul faced throughout his ministry. Now listen, and can you imagine what his life was like? Five times I've received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day, I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked. I mean, Talk about having a bad go in life. Yet in our text, right in the center of that reading, Paul says, we do not lose heart. He says this twice in 2 Corinthians. In Philippians, he talks about pressing on. He just keeps going. He doesn't lose heart. He keeps pressing on despite all of the hardships, adversity, the pain, and persecution that he has to go through. What keeps you going through hardship, adversity, and pain? In our reading today, we get a glimpse of what kept Paul going. His convictions and perspective on life that radically impacted how he dealt with all of the hardship, adversity, and pain. And one of the things I noticed was that Paul believed something was happening in and through all of the hardship, the adversity, and pain. Notice what Paul says about the outer and inner nature. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. 
While the exterior was wasting away and declining, the inward reality was being renewed day by day. I believe that the real you, the inner nature, can have a very different trajectory than what is happening on the outside. An, an exterior reality of decline and decay. Now, I'm told that I, I don't look my age, but I have now come into my mid fifties. And every now and then when I have to confront my age, I start wondering what happened? You know, a few, few weeks ago, I bent over to put on my shoes and I threw a wrench in my back that lasted for days. I know that that, that, that sounds kind of minor for many of you, but I, I, I couldn't help but just laugh. I, I was just putting on my shoes. I wasn't out playing football, lifting weights at the gym or doing anything strenuous. I was just putting on my shoes. Do you ever look at yourself in the mirror or find your body not working the way it used to and you start and you wonder, oh my gosh, what happened? Now for Paul, it wasn't just about age. His body was literally being beaten down as he faced whips and rods and hunger and exposure. As Paul writes, his outer nature was wasting away. But notice what he says about the inner nature. For Paul, as he thought about his inner nature, he knew that it was being renewed day by day. When he talks about the inner nature being renewed, it, it's going in the opposite direction compared to the outer nature. As his outer nature is wearing down, his inner nature is gaining life. It's becoming more alive. And let me add, this is set in the passive tense. He is not renewing his inner nature. God is. The implied active agent is God. The sense of what Paul is getting at in 2 Corinthians is, is that God is at work to do this work of inward renewal in life. That God is at work to give you more life, to give Paul more life from the inside out. And so it begs the question, what about us? What might it mean for us to be renewed from the inside out? For the real you that is inside of you to become more alive and renewed. Well, notice what Paul says about how this happens for him. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For Paul, he sees and understands that all of the hardship, the adversity, the pain, it was all being used by God to do something in him, to prepare an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. When you study 2 Corinthians, especially around the section that I read for us today, you hear Paul talk a lot about glory. Glory is like the blazing, shining reflection of God. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai to meet with God, Paul recounts how Moses' face was shining so brightly when he came down off that mountain that people weren't even able to look at him. That's glory. That's God's glory having rubbed off on Moses and literally lighting up his face with a brilliance that could not be looked upon. And when we become Christians, whether young age or older, a new life has been given us within. A new life that is meant to shine with the glory of God. In another part of 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, for it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
the God of creation, who in the beginning spoke light into being and said, let light shine out of darkness. This same God has in a sense done that again in us. Because of Jesus's life, death and resurrection, new life is given us. It's been put into our hearts. And it's like God looks inside of you and says, let light shine out of darkness. Your sins are forgiven. You are made new. It's new life. It's light. It's the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As Christians, the real you that is inside of you has been recreated by God in Jesus Christ and is meant to shine with the brilliance of the glory of God. But what Paul also recognizes is that brightness, the brightness of that glory is being shaped by God through adversity, pain, and hardship. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Now, I wouldn't immediately look at what Paul had to go through and call it slight and momentary affliction. But for Paul, compared with what was really going on inside of him, the light of the glory of God growing and burning brighter, well, what was going on on the outside for him was then considered slight and momentary. And he sees that God was using all of the stuff happening to him to his exterior, to the outer nature, that God was using all of that to prepare or to develop the glory within so that one day, on resurrection day, when the outer nature is remade in resurrection glory, what has been happening on the inside of him would now be on full display, glory, an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. For Paul, having, despite having to endure incredible adversity, hardship, and pain, he knows that God is using all of it to renew him from the inside out, to deepen the glory inside that had been given him in and through Jesus Christ. And I think this can be the case for us as well. But I don't think this is automatic. It's not always the case that our adversity, our hardship, our pain will be used by God to bring renewal and life from within. I don't think it's always the case that the hardship and pain will be transformed into glory inside of us. I think the clue is in verse 15 of our reading. Yes, everything is for your sake. So that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Notice Paul's focus in life. Paul was living a gospel-focused life that sought to benefit the benefit of others. A gospel-focused life that sought the benefit of others. His mission was that through him, more and more people would come to know and experience the grace of God in Jesus Christ. He wanted the grace of God to extend to more and more people through him. You know, we Episcopalians, uh, when we get baptized, we make a promise before God and the church. We're asked, will you proclaim the good news of God in Christ by word and deed? And we answer, I will, with God's help. We say that in our baptism, we renew this in the renewal of baptismal vows every year when others get baptized. We promise to proclaim the good news of God in Christ by word and deed. That was Paul's focus in life. That was his priority. And as he pursued this priority in life, God was doing the work of transforming all of the adversity, the hardship and pain in his life into glory within. I believe that as we live a God-oriented life 
that is lived for the sake of others, a gospel-focused life. God takes whatever adversity, hardship, and pain we endure and transforms it into inward glory. Are you seeking to share by word and deed the love of Christ with others? Is that a priority for you? I believe that as you experience hardship, adversity, and pain in seeking a gospel-focused life for the benefit of others, God comes alongside of you and transforms all of the adversity, the hardship, and the pain, transforms all of it along the way into glory within. And this happens over the course of your life. You are renewed from the inside out and will one day shine with the glory of God. And think about what is happening when you seek to live a gospel-focused life for the benefit of others. You seek to share the love of God with others. And for this to truly be about God's love being shared through you, it requires sacrifice. It It will require faith. It will require forgiveness. It will require obeying God's call to love others as God has loved us in Christ. What does that look like? It looks like the cross. That's what the cross of Jesus is about, isn't it? Sacrifice, forgiveness, love, obedience to God's leading. Paul even talks about carrying around the death of Jesus. I think this is what he's talking about, living his life in a way that looked like the death of Jesus, the cross. I think that's what he's talking about. Living his life in a way that looked like the sacrificial love and obedience of Jesus and his cross. And what is the result? Your own renewal, your inner nature growing in life and glory. And what does that look like? Resurrection. See, what Jesus did on the cross was a one-time event that changed everything. It brought life and forgiveness and salvation to our world. But it gets mirrored in the lives of his people as we seek to live by his example. Now we who follow Jesus are called to show the world his cross in our gospel-focused lives that are lived for the sake of others. And as we do, as we experience hardship, adversity, pain, God takes all of that pain and transforms it into glory, the resurrection being played out in our own lives. Think about it. As followers of Jesus, we are called to live cross-shaped lives for the sake of others. And as we do, God transforms all of the suffering and pain into new life. We become flesh and blood pictures of the gospel for the world to see. And one day, all of the suffering, all of the pain will be swallowed up by resurrection glory. As Paul writes, We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. And on that day, what God has done to transform our suffering and pain will be shining with blazing glory out of us. Because as we sought to live gospel-focused lives for the benefit of others, God was transforming all of the pain and the hardship along the way to become glory in us. Like adding fuel to the fire, adversity, hardship, and pain was being changed into fuel for glory. Amen.
Let us pray. Dear God, from the birds chirping to the cicadas singing, all of nature sings your praises. May we too be mindful of your kindness and mercy towards us. We thank you, O oh God, for the small miracles that we often overlook and take for granted, like this very breath and this very moment. We thank you, God, for your grace and mercy. In this season of growth, open our hearts to grow in your love, love that goes beyond words, but a love and action that leads to the thriving of all people. We pray for those who are suffering, living in war zones, in refugee camps, and on the margins of the margins. We pray for the unhoused, for the incarcerated, and for those without hope. It is June, the month we celebrate pride. We pray for all of our LGBTQIA siblings, those who are out, and those who live in fear of others finding out. We pray for queer families, children, and organizations engaging in life-saving work. We pray for those who are misunderstood and struggling. We pray for our siblings who are alone and forgotten. God, the gift of the rainbow you gifted to us, we give you thanks for such beauty being made manifest in your people. Dear God, help us to resist evil and fear by trusting your creative process in our lives. May your spirit transform us and make us new. Help us to place our trust in you so that when we are serving others, they may come to know you by your love and power. Give us courage and great joy as we serve you. Please hear us, O oh God, when we pray the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us continue with our prayer for Princeton. O oh, eternal God, the source of life and light for all peoples, we pray you would endow this university with your grace and wisdom. Give inspiration and understanding to those who teach and to those who learn. Grant vision to its trustees and administrators, to all who work here and to all who bear her name. Give your guiding spirit of sacrificial courage and loving service. Amen. Receive now this benediction. Go in peace, knowing the miracles that God has produced in your life. Be assured that there are still more miracles to come. Bear witness to God's love to all you meet. In the name of the Creator, the Holy One who resides with you always, go in peace. Amen.